talk about him as opposed to talk about my experience interacting with Sheikh Ahmed Keeler. I'll go by saying that he was born in 1942 and Christian Paul Godfrey. He was brought up during the 1940s and the 50s in a conservative, upper middle class, Anglo-Catholic Anglo family. He belonged to the last generation that was educated to serve an empire, however, was in the final stages of dissolution. On leaving school, he became deeply involved in the cultural movements of the 60s that were, open, that were an open revolt against that, that society that had nurtured him. Amongst the things that he did when he finished drama school uh, was to set up a gallery called Signals, Modern Art in the 1960s, which was at the, vof which was at the forefront of the international avant-garde scene of art. A, during those years, a chance meeting with a master musician from India introduced Ahmed to a wonderful new cultural realm. In response to that encounter with that master musician from India, Ahmed formulated and organized the World of Islam Festival that took place in London in 1976. It was opened by Her Majesty the Queen and was the most comprehensive exposition of Islamic culture ever to have taken place in the West. It was a seminal event that showcased the brilliant spectrum of Islamic civilization into the Western public imagination. The festival brought together all the major museums, libraries, universities, and learned societies and scholars engaged in Islamic studies in a great celebration of the arts and civilization of Islam. Six months before the festival opened, Ahmed embraced Islam. He has spent his working life since in establishing and engaging with the projects that explore and present Islamic culture as a holistic environmental manifestation. Residing in Cambridge for the last 22 years, Ahmed has, a, has had a profound impact on a number of students passing through the university. At a time of growing instability, he is now lecturing and participating in seminars encouraging us to judge the success of human culture through the criteria of Mizan, which is at the heart of the Islamic unfolding. He lectures extensively in different parts of the Muslim world on this topic, recently exploring the idea that the true yardstick for measuring the success of civilization should be the balance it has achieved between the spiritual, social, and material needs of humanity, a balance which makes it possible to live in harmony with the natural world. He was also the founder and director of the Golden Web Foundation, which was engaged in developing a new kind of project dedicated to, to the study of the pre-modern Afro-Eurasian world. And without further ado, I give you Ahmed the floor. Please welcome Ahmed Keeler. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. I'm very touched by Fahad's very kind introduction. And it's wonderful to be here in Qatar. And this is the first time that this presentation has been given in the Arab world. Um, so it's quite a, an important moment for me. I want to start by introducing you to Sir Roland Penrose. And I'm taking you back 50 years. Now, Sir Roland Penrose was a poet, a writer, an artist, a surrealist artist, and pretty well single-handedly 
was the great promoter of modern art. During the 40s, the 30s, 40s, 50s, in London. And he founded, with Sir Herbert Reed, the, the Institute of Contemporary Arts. Now, he, it, just to show you how fragile modern art was, Sir Roland Penrose had an immense collection because he was the friend and the biographer of Picasso, of Miro, of, of Clay, of Carrico, and he built a huge collection. But whenever the Institute in its beginning days, it was just when it was just, just at the starting, when it needed money, he sold one of his works of art. And in the process of selling it, he would then replace the painting with a copy. And as a sign of his enormous generosity, his house gradually, gradually filled up with copies. Because in those days, in the 60s, in the early 60s, it was a real struggle to maintain and to support modern art, the avant-garde. And I, if you think of it now, it's incredible. 50 years on, Tate Modern, which is the largest of the great museums of modern art in the world, is the second biggest tourist attraction in London. Millions of people passing through its doors every, every year. And modern art has become the universal form. If you look up modern art in Bhutan, it's there. There are galleries of modern art in Bhutan. Buddhism is being drawn in to modern art in Bhutan. So every nation on earth now has modern art. And the question is this, is modern art the universal form which all of humanity is entering into? If you think of the Venice Biennale, when I had my gallery in the 60s, it was, it was very much a Western affair. Or the San Paolo Biennale. Now these Biennales are universal. They're global phenomena. So what's happened to the traditional forms which relate to a particular culture? For example, the Islamic world had its art. So is this something that means that we now have a dual situation where a nation has its art, a culture has its art, but it also has modern art? Or are we going through a metamorphosis whereby all the arts of the world are transforming and becoming modern? And this is what I want to ponder and to suggest that what I want to show you is my reflections upon this question. Now, in order to understand the West, we have to realize that the West is not one world, one culture. It's three completely separate whole cultures which live in one world, in one Westerner, but are completely separate. The Christian, you often hear the term, the Christian world, the civilized world, and the modern world. And if you look at those three pictures, the cathedral, the classical building, and the tower block, the great skyscraper. You tell me, what connects them? There's no connection between them. They are completely separate aesthetics. And if we begin with the Christian world, now it is in England that this separation is most clearly defined. 
we start with Christianity in England. Now in England, Christianity was brought by the saints. It was a very, very small world in, in the 6th century, 1500 years ago. It was a tribal world, it was a village world. And what was brought was a, was a complete Christianity. A whole culture which was brought by the monks, the monasteries. St. Columba, who came from Ireland, and St. Augustine, who came from Rome. And the art, first of all, was very much contained within the book. You had the, the glorious books which were produced in the monasteries. And then, of course, the subject of the paintings were the subject of, principally, the Christian year, the Christian story. The churches, the parish churches, the village world, which we still have in England. All over England you find these are the Saxon villages, which are the, the core. And here we have this incredible church architecture. And what's very important to understand is that the paintings, the decoration, all of that was environmental. It was a part of a whole Christian environment. It was a part of the whole process of worship. Here we have the great saint, St. Thomas of Becket, the great drama of his martyrdom, which again became a, a huge subject for art. And the reliquaries, because the, the bodies, the remains of the saints were precious, and the reliquaries in which these were kept were works of art in order to contain the relic. But the important thing was the relic. That was the, the valuable thing. And then, of course, the pilgrimage. The pilgrimage became a huge subject for art, for literature. And then, look at this. The cathedrals that started to be built. Because after 500 years, gradually, towns started to develop. The great marketplaces started to emerge, and in the center of them were the great cathedrals, but what was most important was the shrine. Canterbury Cathedral was rebuilt in order to be able to be so magnificent to contain the shrine of St. Thomas of Becket, St. Cuthbert, the great saint of the north. And look at that building. It took over a hundred years to build. And look at the scale of what was around it. Look at the scale. It absolutely was like something of such huge proportions, surrounded by something that was very modest. St. Ethelred, the great saint of Ely. And these cathedrals literally ascended to heaven. The vertical aspect, the whole, con the, the whole idea of, of, of that heavenly direction. And the arts that went into them, the crafts, the sculpture. And again, the sculpture was completely integrated within the whole environment. It was a total environment. So when people entered the cathedral, they were entering the house of God. There was the presence of the saint, and there was the presence of the sacrament. God was present. And the whole power structure in which you had the church and the monarch was completely connected. This is Richard II. One culture, Richard II, praying with St. John the Baptist and the two great monarch saints, the great king saints of England. Edmund the Martyr and Edward the Confessor. And there you have Mary with the child Jesus and the saints and, and, the, and the angels. It's an altarpiece. It's an altarpiece. All these were all these artists that, arts that I've shown you 
were all to do with the altar or to do with the decoration of the church. And then, within the space of 20 years, it all came crashing down. Nearly a thousand buildings across England, Scotland, Wales, were destroyed within 20 years. And the saints who were contained within them, their bodies were taken out and scattered. There has never been a destruction by a culture upon itself to compare with it. And after a hundred years, the church was reduced to a translated book, but no art. No art. But what came next was truly extraordinary. Because now we come to the civilized world. And having made a ruin of the whole core of their own world, the Europeans dug up a civilization that had been dead for a thousand years, brushed it off, and worshipped it. Great temples were created. These huge mausoleums were created. And all over Europe, all over the, 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 the world of the Greeks and the Romans, all the dead things out of the earth were taken up, brushed off, broken <coughs> columns, all these different things, and placed within this new temple. And then, in terms of art, there was the challenge to recreate that great Greco-Roman forms of art. Because suddenly they had been introduced to something that was human. And what was very important was that the status of the artist at this moment changed. It's a very important moment. Because the art, two things happened. One was that Vasari, the great uh, biographer of the Renaissance painters, he changed the, the term that was used for the painter. And he used the term artifacts, artificer. And this is a term that previously had been used to describe the creator God. And the other was that the term genius changed. Genius, which before had been a term which meant a spirit, a familial spirit. With the Renaissance, that term became a term that entered into the human and became actually within the actual nature, the actual character of the individual. So you became a genius. You had the genius. And so, Renaissance was that the human stepped out of what was an organic culture and looked at another world from outside. In other words, it became an observer of another world. And that's exactly what also happened in terms of the natural world. The human being, instead of being within the natural world, a part of, actually became an observer of it. And this meant that you got a new kind of thinker, a thinker who was looking at the material world as an object, as a reality that had a, a self-existence. Now, 
This began to release tremendous powers. Because the deeper you go into materiality, the greater are the forces that are released. The greater the equations, the possibilities start to emerge, the physical realities start to come out. But that power could not be actually utilized. It could not come to, to, into being without a marriage. And that marriage was the marriage between the merchant and this new kind of thinker, this new kind of scientist. We call them scientists. Because the merchant is the person in society that was responsible for looking after the material world. They would take this from here and they would carry it over to there. And if you didn't have something over there, they'd take that and they'd bring it to there. And that was their role. That was what they did. But when this marriage took place, unbelievable forces started to be released and you got this major change which was we went from human scale human time to the creation of machine scale machine time now during the 19th century this new culture, this new world which was being born and which was beginning to grow, was clothed in civilization. It hadn't impacted upon the culture, or very little. This is the, the great banquet in the city of London. And this is the city of London at the time, in the 19th century. And if Julius Caesar had arrived, and gone into what he thought was a temple, he would have found it was a bank. And he would have been very confused. Because it was a kind of strange Roman city. But it was clothing a new culture. A very different culture that was being born. And that culture didn't actually burst through in England. It burst through in America. And these are some of the great founders. These are the men who through using this new power started to move into the situation of providing the world with everything it needed. How you dressed, what you ate, the house you lived in, what you were entertained by, every aspect of your life. And they entered into the realm of morality and ethics. A realm which up until this time had always been in the, in, in the, in the religious area or the ethical area. The civilized area. Now it was into the business area. Because through their products, they were creating a moral, a different moral, a different ethical universe. And the artists poured into this world of showing, of depicting, of creating these beautiful, beautiful artworks which actually showed how we couldn't possibly do without these glorious things. We had to have them. Look at this amazing picture here. The fine car at half the fine car price. You can take your lady friend into the open, up the mountain, free, absolutely gorgeous, wonderful. There's a great deal of morality and ethics tied into all of that. If you think about it, they used to think this was good for your health. <laughs> How could you possibly not enjoy your Guinness when this Pelican had become such a friend. And of course, flying, we're free, free like birds, we can go everywhere. And of course, we have to smell nice. And now, 
The great places of worship are replaced by the shopping mall. This is the new temple. But there's a great problem. And that problem is that we human beings simply cannot absorb all of this. We cannot absorb it. This is the little tiny spot of the great plastic lake in the middle of the Pacific, which is larger than the size of Texas. It's a place where all the currents come together. But what has happened is that this new culture, this new modern world, has actually now produced a new way of life. And that way of life is divided between work and leisure. Now work is very monastic, it's very disciplined, it's very regimented, and it's very hard. Leisure is whatever you want it to be. You can watch television until your eyes drop out. You can be a, a, a football fanatic to the point that football becomes your whole life. It's very easy. Or you can go to pop concerts every weekend. It's not difficult. Paradise, paradise was that place where God willing is a part of our afterlife, that perfection. Now it's that two or three weeks when one is released from the workhorse and you can go to somewhere which is completely unspoiled. Until we spoil it, you have to find somewhere new. And the whole earth has been turned into a playground. And now, the natural world is disappearing more and more into reservations, like what we did with the, with the Native Americans when we arrived in, in America. It's shrinking, and we go and we look at it. We are observers. We go and look at nature. We look at the natural world. If we're of a cultural bent, we can go and see any culture in the world. Go to our museums, they're full of thousands of dead cultures. Or we can go and, and, and have the food of any world. And if we're of a religious bent, we can go to church, or we can go to the mosque, or we can go to the, to the synagogue, the temple. This is leisure, as long as it doesn't get in, into work. This is the leisure, this is the leisure part. It's, 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 a, it's an optional thing. And the machine, the machine has completely taken the human being so that the human being is now totally attached to the outside. Through the ear, through the eye, through the voice. Externally connected. And you remove the machines from young people now and they become very nervous because it's difficult to be inside it's difficult to be with oneself and in order to create this new culture the whole family has been reconstructed both husband and wife are out working in order to Buy the things which are necessary to keep the whole thing rolling. And the children are sent off to nurseries to learn how to be good consumers. Because that is the, the nature of what this new culture demands. It's a consumer. It's a personal consumer. And the little children are sent to nurseries where they play with things and get bored and then they play with another thing and their short-term memory is beautifully, beautifully educated. Because that's what the modern culture requires. It's a short-term memory. It's not the long-term memory. And the celebrity. These are now the famous ones. These are the famous ones. So these three worlds you have the saint. And the Christian, it was a matter of wanting to know and study and be told the stories of the lives of saints. To inspire us. In the civilized, 
It was to know about the heroes, their great battles, their, their, their courage, their nobility. In the modern, it's what David Beckham had for breakfast. No, not the sweet. And at the center of this new world is the financial district. And the financial district has become so complex that even those who are in it don't understand how it works. And this financial sector has completely dwarfed the old spiritual center. And at the heart of this financial sector which is growing in every country, in every city, is the holy of holies, the stock market. Because there is only one thing that is absolutely fundamental about this new modern culture, and that is if it goes up, it's heaven. If it goes down, it's hell. That's it. Growth is the only thing that is absolutely essential and that drives this new modern culture. And it now has born and created its own educational system. The marriage between this new kind of knowledge, the science, and the merchant, business studies. When I went to Cambridge with my wife 22 years ago, we, Cambridge was still a, a, a university in which the humanities were still king, still at the center. There was no business studies, there was no uh, business school. Now, the only subjects that are funded by the government of Great Britain are the sciences and business studies. And higher education is under the Ministry of Business and Innovation. Three systems, three educational systems. Now the humanities have almost disappeared. They're on the prison. And the, the, the uh, religious studies is very eccentric. It's right on the very edge. Three different worlds. So here we have the first, the power of the Christian was in the church and the monarch. The power of the civilized was the warrior statesman. The power of the modern is the scientist businessman. And this, if anybody wants to know, is John D. Rockefeller, who's probably the richest man that's ever been on this planet. Each one had its own educational system. Each one has its own manifestation, physical manifestation. And each one has its own art manifestation. And there are three worlds which inhabit the modern Western person. He is Christian, he is civilized, and he is modern. But these worlds coexist, but are in a continuous state of contradiction. Now you may ask me, where's modern art? Where is it gone? Where is it? Where is it in this whole affair? I call this the canary in the mine. Now, the miners in England, in the olden times, used to take a canary down into the mine. Because a canary has a very tiny lungs. And if there was a gas leak, the canary would drop dead immediately. And there was one man watching the canary. And if it dropped, the alarm was given, and people had a chance to get out. The canary was a warner. 
He warned of danger. Now, in the 19th century, artists became fed up and ill at ease and rebellious against the salons in Paris, the Paris Salon, which was producing the life drawings. Napoleon was still a huge subject, tremendous subject, and of course the Greek myths. The Greek myths were endlessly being played. And you had this very uh, fine artist like Jericho and Delacroix, but Angre, but for the certain artists, they just felt that this was no longer real, it no longer had life. It was a kind of dead, deadness which they wanted to, they wanted to reconnect with life. So what you had is you had the artists looking around them and wanting to engage with life that was living around them. And you got money. And of course for the establishment, this was a, an absolute horror. This was not painting. You cannot imagine the horror that this kind of work produced uh, in, in uh, Monet. He was, he was uh, seen as being absolutely beyond the pale in terms of his work. Van Gogh. But all of them were connecting into the reality of nature around them, the world that was existing around them. And then you got Cézanne, where he was beginning to see shapes and patterns. Because what happened was that the artist rebelled against the establishment, the salon, and became connected to what was happening around them and what they were feeling inside of them. They rejected the whole Renaissance framework, but also they rejected the society, the morals and the ethics of the society, and they started to live by their own rules. And they were called Bohemians. This is where the term comes from. Gypsies, Bohemians. It was a term of abuse, like Gothic. Of course, it then became a, a, a celebratory term. But it was originally a term of abuse. Because the artist became an outsider, a rebel. And then moving into the 20th century, that terrible, terrible century that passed, with its terrible wars, we have the monumental figure of Picasso. And when people saw what Picasso was doing, they said, that's horrible. And Picasso said, of course it's horrible was destroyed, the suffering of the people, the killing of the horses, everything. It was horrible. And that is what I'm expressing, is the pure horror. But Picasso was also expressing the great upsurge of sexuality, which made the 21st, 20th century into this century when suddenly there was this huge emergence very much through the whole psychoanalysis, Freud, bring out everything into the open. So his obsession, because he was a huge figure, Picasso, his obsession with the ladies, with the, with, with the female, with the woman. The nude, of course, was an essential part of, of Western, uh, since the Renaissance, but this was the suffering. He said, one of his remarks was, Women are machines made for suffering. He said women are either goddesses or doormats. And the muse was his whole life. His model became his muse and was a goddess until she became a doormat and was replaced. And here we have the extraordinary... This is the drawing. Picasso was 
classically trained. He could draw anything. He could draw anything. And then the next replacement, cubism. Every style, every form was explored by Picasso. But this lady died. She died. And two years later, the next muse. And she was a ballet dancer at Diagonet's Ballet, who was very bourgeois. She wanted a nice house in the middle of Paris, a nice apartment. So Picasso went classical. And he moved in. But after having a child and 10 years, he got bored to death. And he had his new muse. And she lasted 10 years. And then he had another one. And this one gave two children to him. And she left him. She left him. She was the only one who left him. The others couldn't leave him. And finally, when he was an old man, this was the final lady who looked after him till he died. And as he went through his life, Picasso became more and more reclusive because the only thing that he could do was to make art. He had to make art. Here we have a painting, a self-portrait, when he was young. And this one. And this is his final. Haunting, terrifying self-portrait. Look at that face. Look at the fear. The madness in that face. And one of the people who really was deeply moved by Picasso and says that I started painting because of Picasso was Francis Bacon. Now Francis Bacon was a sensitive artist and at the beginning of the Second World War he wasn't accepted for health reasons into the army. So he volunteered to go into the force in London which took out the dead bodies and the, and the main bodies. And he was traumatized. And this triptych, and again the triptych is interesting because they, they, they uh, mirror the triptych, the Christian triptych, which is very important in the Christian uh, iconography. This is a friend. This is how he sees, how he envisions. Can you imagine what's in that man's soul to produce that horrific image? And then we come to Pollock. Pollock was a very pure man. And what he picked up was chaos. He saw chaos. And he took that chaos and produced out of that chaos his work. And his life, as that chaos passed through his soul, became more and more chaos. Until finally at the age of 44, drunk on drugs, in a state of absolute manic and depression, in a car, an open car, going at 100 miles an hour with his mistress and another woman in the car, he drove into a tree and died. And when I look at that painting, which was bought for $170 million, I look at that painting and I think to myself, how can you put that painting up, which is a celebrate, which is basically you're saying a great work of art, but actually it's Pollock saying, this world is crazy. This world is in a state of total chaos. That is the meaning. Where is the meaning of this art? This man is an artist, a sensitive soul through whom that chaos has passed and that's all he could do. That was the channel that he found to be able to express that because the artist is born and has to express. They see through their eyes and they have to create art. They have to create something that is visual. This is Paolozzi who is showing how human beings are turning into robots. We're all turning into robots. This is Tracy Unruh. 
Tracy Amin, who beautifully represents that Twitter world, that world of, you know, the, 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 the Freudian world, where every, every thought you have, every idea that, that gurgles up from inside of you, you have to share it. This is her tent, in which she's written all the, the, the names of all those that she slept with. And then we come to her bed. After four days of trauma that she suffered in her bed, breaking up with her boyfriend, sleeping for two of them, it's all documented because this is a self-portrait. That's what she's spoken of it as. It's a self-portrait. And she's all the detritus of that catastrophe is around the bed. She phoned her agent, Charles Sachi. She said, I have a new work of art. He said, what is it? And she said, it's my bed. And he said, that's fantastic. That's, that's new. Because this is the other thing. Originality. You've got to produce something original. And when Tracy was interviewed, the interviewer said to her, but you must admit it's a very ugly bed. And she was shocked. She was shocked. She said, what do you mean? It's beautiful. And what one has to realize is that to her eyes, it is beautiful. That bed is beautiful. Her whole experience in it has been captured. And when it was first shown, there was an outcry. Everybody found it ridiculous. Because there's one question. If it was a work of art, if it was a work of art, it was worth 150000 because that's what Charles Sachin paid for it. If it wasn't, it was ready for the skip. But everything hung on the fact is, is it art? So what happened to Tracy was that in 2007, she became an RA, a Royal Academician. She was accepted into the higher excellence. In 2010, David Cameron, when he went into Downing Street, our Prime Minister, had the opportunity to select any work of art from the National Collection for Downing Street. And he chose a Tracy Armin because he said she was his favorite artist. And then in 2012, Her Majesty the Queen honored her. She became a CBE, a companion of the British Empire. Now the British Empire doesn't exist anymore, but the honors are still very much there. <laughs> and finally, finally, last year, this work of art was auctioned and bought by a German count for 2.54 million pounds. And something very extraordinary has happened. We're talking about the rebels, right? We're talking about the outsiders. But what has happened is that the rebels have become the establishment. The rebels have become the establishment. And this we come now to the point where we reach the artist who is one of the most terrifying in terms of the human condition. Because we come to Damien Hirst. Now Damien Hirst was from a Catholic family, an Irish Catholic background. And when he was very young, his parents divorced. And his mother was refused the sacrament. Now Damien Hirst lost his faith. He became an atheist. And what he then has spent in terms of his art, apart from a few things which are sort of the child, childlike things, like balloons bouncing up and down on things, or, or spots of different colors, what he's actually absolutely focused on is death. Not the Catholic death, but the atheist's death of death 
without redemption. The material death, and there are two aspects to his work. Either it's organic, like this work here, the cycle of the death of the fly, the calf's head, the maggots forming, flying around and then being zapped by the zapper. Death without redemption. So what this journey has been, from artists who rebelled at a time when art was very rich in terms of technique, to a time when art has become so poor because it's now simply an idea, but an idea which must be original. What is really frightening is that this modern art has actually <coughs> reflected the passage of the modern soul. The gradual impoverishment and alienation of the modern soul. The canary in the mine, the artists are warners. However, instead of taking the warning, it has turned into a huge cult. And it's a cult which has a kind of, it's a parody of, of Christianity because Christianity is still the most powerful force in Western culture. Jesus Christ is still the most powerful figure. And his elimination has meant that the void, which is endlessly filled by little gods. And these six artists are all Christ figures in the sense that they're all creators who have sacrificed their beings. Now the problem is, nobody understands what the Dickens they're talking about, what they're doing. So they need a critic to explain. They need the high priest to be between the God and the people. So that the high priest can explain to you. And then you say, oh, and I understand. And at that point you have the patrons who come in and say, my goodness, we've got to get in on this because we've got to protect these, these geniuses, these creative spirits. This is the sale of the screen. 130, 130 million dollars for a painting which is a terrifying painting. Uh, but he's not screaming. He's covering his ears because on one side of the bridge is an insane asylum. And on the other side of the bridge, there's an abattoir. And there are screams coming from both of them. And he's covering his ears in agony. And that suffering, that nightmare scene. And then, of course, there's the moment when the artist is canonized and becomes of the immortals. And this is the retrospective exhibition when Damien Hirst, Tate Modern, received his canonization. And his whole exhibition was an exhibition on the different themes of death without redemption. Death by cigarette. Dead fish. Pills which kill you. Surgical instruments. More pills. And dead butterflies. <coughs> Finally, the chilling understanding of death and money. It's not pretty, but just imagine when you think of our world. When you think of our world, here's an artist. At the time of the cathedrals, he'd have been a master builder. He's one of the most powerful people. Unbelievable what that man's been able to do with nothing. But such a victim, because all he's got, what has he got to respond to? A world that is dying and is obsessed with one thing, money. 
And of course, this new world of modern art, which has conquered everywhere. As globalization goes, so modern art goes, has its buildings. And these buildings are in a permanent state of disorientation, permanently in a state of disequilibrium. Because what has happened is that because the artist has become the establishment, the artist is now playing a very important role in terms of the modern world, the modern culture. And that is that the artist is making us normalize the abnormal. To live and enjoy disequilibrium, to enjoy chaos, to feel at home in this ever-changing world that can never find equilibrium. To be at home in it. So they have now become, from being the rebels outside, who were the great critics of modernity, to become the agents of this ever-changing world that is gathering and going into further and further chaos. I hope I'm not upsetting you. Now <laughs> listen up. One word. A revelation which produced a whole way of life. A prophet who was a whole man. A whole man who brought a, a complete humanity. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Wonderful time. No, no, please don't apologize. This is beautiful. Now, where you had, in the West, extreme spirituality that broke, leading to extreme materialism that is in the process of breaking, in Islam, these forces, the force of the, of the warrior statesman, the scholar, and the merchant, were fully integrated into one culture. The scholar, because all of knowledge came through the Holy Prophet, and the scholars took care of the knowledge. The warrior statesmen took care of the, the, their, their duty, and the merchants were merchants. And I have a beautiful example to give you of this, because I was in Jeddah at the end of the 80s, at the beginning of the 80s, at a time when I'm sitting with a group of very, very rich businessmen. And these people had gone from being traditional merchants with their small souk shops into mega rich merchants. The, the uh, Nissan and cement, you know, all the fantastic things which are coming in, they were becoming very rich. And I asked them, I said, tell me, was it better before or is it better now? And it was very beautiful because they thought, and then this merchant said, you know, it was better then. I said, why? So I'll give you an instant. We were grouped in our guilds, the goldsmiths, the spice sellers, etc., etc. And the first sale of the day had particular baraka, particular blessing. And if we had made our first sale, and we noticed that our neighbor hadn't, we would say to the person, please, can you go and buy from our neighbor? And until everybody had made their first sale, they, nobody went on to their second sale. And then a lovely thing happened. Because then all of them started telling stories about how business was done. And it was a business that was not based upon competition and warfare. Because the modern corporate world is basically taken over the whole language of warfare. It was based upon collaboration. And 
the, 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 the merchant was very close to the mosque, was very close to his Quran. And that is why all over the Muslim world, Islam was carried by merchants. So each of these very powerful forces, which if they get out of their particular region, can, go, can create havoc. In Islam, they were all contained. Why? Because they all identified with the Prophet ﷺ. They all identified with him. Because the Prophet was a fount of knowledge, he was a warrior, and he was a merchant. The craftsmen never rebelled in Islam. They provided everything that was required for the Islamic way of life and the Islamic environment. Continuously, century after century. And the Islamic city, like the Christian city, but even more so, is an ex a miracle of an organic structure. You can literally walk from one end of an Islamic city to the other over the roofs. Everything is linked. Everything is connected. It's like a beehive. And of course, it completely manifests and represents the Islamic way of life, the Islamic religion, in that the outside is simple, but the inside is rich. You go into the courtyard of the house, and every house is different, every door is different, every lane is different, but it all is unified. And the, 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 the inner spaces of the mosque and the inner spaces of the house is where the life is. It's an inner life. And of course it's unified through calligraphy and geometry. Because geometry is the one way in which you can actually represent unity. And out from Mecca and Medina, you got this extraordinary unfolding. Within the center, the beautiful Kuba Mosque rebuilt by the great architect Abdul Wahid al Wakil. Such purity at the center, the first mosque of Islam. And then from east to west, across great caravan routes which linked all the different fertile areas of the world, such an unfolding. Such an unfolding. Unity and diversity. Wherever Islam went, it connected with the culture that was there. It didn't impose a, an architectural form upon them, or an artistic form. It, it connected, it related to that culture. It brought out what was in that culture, which could then be, become connected and become a part of this extraordinary you know, the center, linking everything up, the Kaaba. Now, Islam experienced three challenges because three Wests came to it. Three quite separate, different Wests. The first was the Christian. And the Christians wanted to recover their center, Jerusalem. And the Crusades took place. And within a hundred years or so, Jerusalem went back to the Muslims, and indeed, Islam expanded hugely during that period because it covered Byzantium, the Eastern Christian world. 
But the second of these worlds that appeared, the civilized West, was a different matter. This was the West of the warrior statesman, most perfectly represented by Napoleon Bonaparte. A civilization in which military by land and sea was hugely developed. And the empires of Rome were recreated, none greater than that of the British Empire. Now, this culturally had devastating effects upon all the worlds that it connected with. But it had a devastating effect upon the world of Islam. Because the first thing that the conquerors did was to get out their bucket and spade and start digging. Because they knew how to relate to dead worlds, but they didn't know how to relate to living worlds. When they arrived, when they, the uh, Europeans arrived in, in uh, Egypt, in Cairo, they went and started digging under the ferret. And the Egyptians were standing around looking at these people and saying, well, that's it, isn't it? I mean, now we know. We've always suspected that we now know these people are crazy. We know they're lunatic. I mean, the only reason you go and dig up a dead, a dead world is to get the gold out. Within a generation, they were dusting off and putting the things together and creating these great mausoleum of the dead. But the other thing that happened was because the civilization was the classical civilization. Because the classical was the criteria by which you judged a civilization. Wherever the European went, he built in the classical style. So in India, the new palaces, the new government buildings were built in the classical style. In Singapore, in Burma, in Egypt, in every country, which meant that the traditional living culture ceased. And the Turkish Ottoman Empire was so demoralized in the 19th century that it moved out of one of the most glorious palaces on earth, which is the top capital, and built their Versailles on the Bosphorus. Versailles. Nothing to do with their culture but simply because they were overwhelmed by the success of the European culture. And this meant that the living Islamic culture went into the museum. The museum, because let us not be under any delusions about this. The museums are places for dead cultures. That's where the Europeans have collected the worlds that have died, the cultures that are dead. culture emerged when this new metamorphosis happened in the West and this new unbelievably powerful world arrived, the Muslim world had absolutely no resistance. Crazy calligraphy. Artist, I'm making my expression of calligraphy. $800,000. A traditional calligrapher who takes 10 years in order to be able to master has no prestige anymore. This is where the prestige lies. You know, Third-rate Picassos. Art, one of the winners is, is Raza, the famous uh, Indian. Millions, multi-millions. <coughs> He's the Indian great modern artist. This is the F1 in Abu Dhabi after the F1, the great celebration. Metallic something or metal metallic. I mean, yeah, this is a. <laughs> and out of this, a completely new world. Just come down, alien. But let us be under no illusions about this. This world is not just alien here, it's alien everywhere. The scale. You feel like an ant. 
You can't even move around in the things because you're in these machines which don't move. It's alien to all of us, all human beings, not just to us Muslims. But this is very alien, coming into the desert. Now, I was in Mecca, the Haram, in the early 80s. And they had these water carries who used to serve you water out of these beautiful amphibs. And these go right back to the very beginning of time. Abraham would have used them. And they go right back to the very beginning of pottery. They're a miracle invention. Because you put them in the sand, they're unglazed, it evaporates, and it keeps the water cool. And when they are finished, they break up and go back into the earth, and they're made locally. And something moved me to go to the water carrier to ask him if I could buy his and for and he looked at me as I was crazy, but he did sell it to me. And I bought it, and I took it home, and it, it sits in my little kibble in my bedroom to give me the direction to Mecca. The next time I went to the Haram, no connection. There was no relationship. To, that did not come out of that. That came out of some in somebody's mind thinking how to do it. Two different worlds. When Sinan, the great architect of, of Iran, of, of uh, the, Otto, Ottoman, uh, the, um, the Ottoman Empire, 500 years ago, was sent by Sinan, the Sultan, to Mecca to build an arcade around the Kaaba, he ensured, and it's the first one you can see, that the arcade was lower than the Kaaba, out of adab, out of good manners, respect for the Kaaba. So let me conclude. Islam created this mizan, this balance, which actually protected the civilization right up until our time. With modernization, these worlds have been replaced. What is in their place has not grown out of them. It's a replacement. But the core is completely intact. This is the remarkable thing about Islam. The core is intact. And one of the things which really brought this home to me was that my son, Ali, on the right, my son Ali was born a musician. And from the age of six, he learned the violin and became very good at it. He went to the Royal Northern College of Music and was working with the maestros and could have become a, a professional violinist. But in his early 20s, he'd also become very deeply involved with the Holy Quran during his teens. And he came to me and he said, Dad, I want to go to Damascus to learn Tajweed, recitation of the Quran. I said, that's wonderful. He said, uh, I said, how do you think you'll get on? And he said, well, it's recitation. I'm a musician. I mean, I can play Beethoven violin and it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't be a problem. Ten years later, in our house in Cambridge, he received his ijaza, which is his, his uh, certificate, that he'd reached the stage where he could teach Tajweed from his master, Sheikh Abdul Razak. And I asked him, I said, you remember the conversation we had 10 years ago? And he said, yes. I said, what does it look like now? He said, I'll tell you. It was a very, very high ladder. It's a very high ladder. My shape is right at the top of the ladder. I can hardly see him. And I put my foot on the first rung of that ladder after 10 years. And what he'd learnt was that a tradition is something that you cannot learn from the outside. It's something that you have to learn from the inside. And it involves your whole being. And it has to come through your heart. Because not only is the science of it 
a hugely precise science, meticulous science. I, I, I attended some of the lessons. I couldn't hear the difference. I could not hear the difference. But he could. But what this form is, it's a vehicle through which the baraka of the Holy Quran is manifested. And the beauty which manifests itself is not something that's added on. It's something that actually reveals the beauty of the Holy Quran and the beauty of Allah Ta'ala. And these people who <coughs> learn what is the first and the most important art of Islam, what they learn and what they become is they become rivers of Baraka in which all of us can benefit. We can all feel and touch it. And this art is completely intact. It's totally alive. The West, the modern, has no center. It's an endless change. Islam, the center, is completely intact. Alhamdulillah. You've been a very kind audience. Thank you very much. Additionally, you get that uh, ordering, which is, is machine ordering, that you get the change. Now, I don't, um, I think for me, the, the, the mystery is that every culture, if you try to look at it from the outside, it's very difficult to read, to really get to the truth of it. You've got to be inside a world. I mean, if you think about the complexity of it, even, even to understand a family, I mean, even to understand one's wife is a problem, or one's husband, or one's children, to understand a complete culture when you're looking at it from the outside, especially when it's dead, is a big problem. So what basically happens is it's the imagination. It runs right. I mean, the imagination, the way we perceive things before, uh, we perceive things in so many different ways. The Romans we've seen in different ways, depending upon how we looked at a particular time. So it's to do with the imagination. So I think that when it comes to modernity, modernity is, is very much defined by this break with the human scale. Abdul Wahid, would, would you... It's... A, it's a, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> anyway, does that, so does that answer in any way at all? <laughs> well, you see that um, I'm at least still digesting. I'm not sure, I don't feel too comfortable to now disrupt this and uh, break it up with questions. And um, I would, however, very much like to invite all of you whoever is interested to a seminar tomorrow at midday that Paul is giving for our students, for our guests, here in this building on the first floor, room 1A11. You are welcome to there, pick up the discussion, ask questions, listen to further thoughts. But for now, I think I would really like to give you the customary invitation to the next lecture, which I think is on the 18th of April, 14th of April, here again in the same lecture room, by Dr. Munya Chetabagudaya curator for North Africa and Iberia at the Museum of Islamic Art, talking about pearls of wisdom, paintings from the Salwan al-Muta, Mamluk mirror for princes. So we
continue with the Islamic art topic here. But now I would like to thank you, Paul Ahmed, very much for your lecture. Very eye-opening, very impressive. Thank you so much.